Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we stand in thy presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for all that you've done for us. Thankful for that wonderful peace that floods our hearts. I pray that the Holy Spirit would take charge and teach us truth, stripping away that which is not true, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you, in whose name we pray. Amen. We are studying together the second epistle of Corinthians verse by verse, and a week ago we were in the 11th chapter at uh, about verse 3. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. In addressing these two letters to the believers at Corinth, the Holy Spirit is presenting the truth of the Word of God to a very, very carnal group of believers, much like us. And we found that as these epistles started, the super spiritual among us might have said, well, goody, goody, you know, God's going to write to those awful carnal believers and boy, is he going to tell them off. And what we found was a concise rehearsal of the grace of God and the sovereignty of God in choosing them for himself, that they were his children, that they had not come behind in any spiritual gift or grace, the word is grace, that they were the recipients of the comfort of God and the direction of God. And then the Holy Spirit dealt very briefly and very directly with the carnality that existed in that fellowship. And we, we find in 2 Corinthians that there was a spirit-directed response to the word of God. And one of the dominant themes of this second letter has been one of comfort. We had a, an extended passage of Scripture where the Holy Spirit illustrates for us our responsibilities as the ministers of God's grace. That That is a practical administration, that we're not living entirely on some uh, plane of existence where Christianity and spirituality are totally separate from the physical realities of our life, but that, in fact, God has ordained that in the body of believers there is an administration of His grace which works both ways, both for those who apparently are in physical need and those who have plenty, that there is a spiritual grace required both ways and that it, it's simply not one privileged group helping out a an underprivileged group, but rather it's a means that God has ordained that might equally distribute the grace of God. We have now reached a section here of the epistle where there's justification of the Word of God, and I think primarily that is the great problem of Christianity today as it was the great problem of Christianity in the days of Corinth. There is surely nothing time-limited in this message. The responsibility always becomes one of authority. I don't believe that this is Paul's word. It's God's word. I believe the author is the Holy Spirit. You know, it becomes extremely interesting that in the areas of Christianity, there are many voices, many voices. The great overriding problem is not where you uh, give your money or how you spend your time for Christ, but, but how you look at the Word of God, where the authority of the Scriptures and the truth of what God has revealed come in. And what you do with this book, how it's handled, how it's taught, how, how much of human merit there is in your grace system. Verse 3, I am terribly afraid, lest by any means, as the serpent deceived Eve through his craftiness, craftiness or cunning, 
And I pointed out to you last week that that is a Greek word which means the ability to do anything. That's quite a statement made by the serpent. I recognize that our fortress is Christ, but don't ever get the idea that in your own strength or, or, or that we in our own strength are any match for the devil. We are not. Our victory is simply yieldness to Christ. And dearly beloved, I am not sure that the great concern in Christianity today is that you, you may have been deceived in what you call the truth of the Word of God. Rather, it seems that our great concern is one of production. You know, how many souls have you saved? You know, what percentage of your income do you give? I am not arguing that you shouldn't give any money for the Lord, that you shouldn't do any work for the Lord, that you shouldn't do any witnessing or Bible teaching or anything else. That's not my argument. I believe that the thesis of this passage of Scripture is one simply of priority and of authority. If God's Word is the authority, then I must handle it very, very carefully. This is what God said. And I personally feel a great responsibility in handling this book. I don't want to teach it wrong. It frightens me to death. I'm afraid that there are many who, feeling that same sense of responsibility, have decided that one way to ensure no guilt is to put a, a tremendous burden of responsibility on you. You know, whereas it seems to me that we are proclaimers of the grace of God. If I have any great burden, it is that you understand clearly the Word of God. Not, not how much you give, not how much you serve. You know, maybe I'm naive and maybe I'm foolish, but it seems to me that those things would follow naturally if there is a correct understanding of the Word of God. Theological error precedes moral error and vice versa. You know, whereas if I spend my time concentrating on the byproducts, you know, it, it may well be that I artificially stimulate you to, to perform what, what are really the byproducts of a personal, deep relationship with God through this book. It would seem to me that each one of us ought to, ought to sense a deep burden in our responsibility to other Christians that, that we have not represented or, or misrepresented the Word of God. Your authorized version says that you be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The word simplicity there means singleness. The text goes on in verse 4, for he... For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus. Now, the, the if there is a first-class condition, that isn't a condition of assumed reality. I'm suggesting to you that the fourth verse is saying that what is presented there is what's going on in Corinth. That somebody, there were more or more than one person, is preaching another Jesus in Corinth. And I'm further suggesting to you that I believe that's what's going on in modern Christianity today. I have no idea how many Jesuses that we could talk about. First of all, it's not only a first class condition, but the, the word another there in, in the text is alas. Now the two main Greek words here, you know, would be heteros and alas, we use another, uh, the word another both ways in the English language. If, if we had a bad toaster, we go by another one, which means we don't want one like the one we had. We want, we want a better one. Or if we had a really good automobile, we go to the salesman and we say, we want another one. I want, a, I want another one just like it. So what he wanted was an alas Rolls Royce. He wanted another one of the same kind in quality. 
If on the other hand you had a, if you had a lemon, you know, automobile, and, and you went to the salesman and said, boy, I never want another car like that. I want another car. You'd use the word heteros. I want another one that isn't like this one. Now, this particular verse has both of those Greek words in there. Both of them. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, that's alas, another of the same kind and quality, whom ye have not received. And you received a different spirit, heteros, or a different gospel, heteros. You know. It's interesting how the uh, serpent, in his beguiling ways, you know, always uses the same Jesus. Modern theology, for example, says that Jesus was an idol. You know, he was a tremendous thinker. He was a great leader. You know, he set a great example. You know, he, he was as divine as we are, and his divinity was an expression of our own. You know, he was a martyr, and he died for what he believed. But, but it's the same Jesus we preach. It's a different gospel, and it's a different spirit, but it's the same Jesus. You know, we're not going to have any, any problem with a, a fellow that comes along and preaches a different Jesus. Unity preaches uh, uh, that Jesus was one of many who were incarnated by God many times. You know, Moses, for example, was Jesus incarnate. Elisha uh, was Jesus incarnate and so forth. You know, the Mormons would teach that, you know, well, sure, Jesus existed. He was the son of Adam and Mary, and that he did, in fact, at, at Cana of Galilee, uh, marry uh, two women. So, that, you know, with two wives, he could produce many children. Uh, theosophy would say that Jesus is a leader, so, so is Buddha or Confucius. Jehovah's Witness uh, would not deny the existence of Jesus. He is, in fact, Michael incarnated. He, he didn't rise from the dead, but he's simply an angel, not God Almighty. He's just an angel. Never claimed to be God. God is, is, is directly, that is, that's directly contrary to the Word of God. I mean, it staggers my mind that some, somebody can knock on my door and with a straight face tell me that Jesus never claimed to be God. He spoke, he spoke Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, and Greek, and the people who heard Him, who were around Him and heard Him, spoke those same, same languages, and they sat there and they listened to Him. And He said, why are you condemning me? And they said, we're condemning you because you claim to be God. He says, that's right. And now 2,000 years later, some guy knocks on my door, doesn't know any Greek, doesn't know any Hebrew, and says, Christ didn't say that. Well, all those people that heard him thought that's what he said. And so, you know, you're going to tell me who don't even know the language that he spoke that that, that isn't what he said? But that's what the, they say, and and thousands of people seem to believe that and follow that. It's the same Jesus, but it's a different spirit and a different gospel. Spiritualism uh, would say that Jesus was a super medium. Not, to, not too many of the mediums ever lived up to that guy. This guy, you know, he, he was medium number one. You know, uh, Christian science uh, would teach that Jesus was a spiritual ideal, a divine leader. He, uh, you know, he was in fact the offspring of Mary's spiritual communion with God, but, but, but they all come back to Jesus. And when we get far enough away that Jesus is not in the teaching, we don't have any problem, you know, with, with the church, the bride of Christ. But I'm, I'm persuaded that within that bride there is a widespread presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is eros. It is, it's a different spirit. It's a different gospel. 
The fourth verse indicates that not only is this going on in Corinth, some, somebody's preaching Jesus, but it is in fact a different spirit and a different gospel than the one that they think, at, or at least they have received, and they put up with it. They put up with it. The chapter started out, you know, I want, I, I want you to endure me, put up with me, bear with me a little in a little, uh, in, in, in a little foolishness here. Uh, verse 4, I am expressing God's jealousy, not mine. Paul's not saying his jealousy, that, you know, that looks like God's, but God's jealousy. And my great concern is that you might have, in fact, been deceived when it comes to the truth of the Word of God. And now the fourth verse presents to me not a potential but a fact that such teaching is occurring in Corinth and that they're enduring it. it. It does not say that they are accepting it, but that they are enduring it. You might well endure him. Is that what you should do? You know, what about this truth that God's presented? <laughs> Verse 5, I, I reckon, I suppose, the word suppose there is legitimai. It's our good old friendly Greek word for logical reasoning. Just like in Romans 6.11, reckon ourselves to be dead to sin, but alive unto God. Reckoning counts it as a fact. You know, I look at the evidence. I, I put that evidence together correctly, and I reach a conclusion based upon those facts. You know, the word is suppose in your authorized version. Some of the translations do put reckon. I, I reckon I reached the conclusion that I was not one tiny bit behind, behind the super apostles. Now, if we put these words in Paul's mouth, you know, we, we may give him a bad image. We may present him as one who brags or boasts, you know, foolishly. But if we recognize that the Holy Spirit is the author, In the epistle to the Galatians, the Holy Spirit has Paul present the argument that he who had received a revelation from God and been commissioned to complete the Word of God went up to Jerusalem and, and laid out for the apostles at Jerusalem the gospel which he was preaching, and he did it very carefully, lest by any means he should run or had run in vain. That is... What he had done in the past was empty and foolish and that what he might do in the future was empty and foolish. But those who, who seemed to be somewhat, whatso, whatsoever they were, makes, makes no matter to me, for God respects no man's person. For they who seemed to be pillars added nothing to me. And I believe that what God is saying there. It was not the person of James or Peter or John. Not that there's anything wrong with these, with these fellows. They're saved by grace, redeemed by grace through Jesus Christ, just as you and I are. But that name calling, that name dropping, and that human reputation are of no merit with God. With, with God. What counted in the life of Paul was God's revelation. What counts in the life of Peter is God's revelation. What counts in my life and in yours is God's revelation. When somebody asks me what Paul's thorn in the flesh is, you know, I, I've always said it was Peter. Now, I don't know whether you agree with that or not, but, but I, believe, I believe Paul must have consistently reached the conclusion that Peter was not redeemed. You know, and I'd assume that Peter probably, he probably had a similar thorn in the flesh, as do you and as do I. You know, he withstood Peter to the face. I don't really suppose Peter enjoyed that too much, you know, because he was to be blamed. Peter was a, well, I mean, it depends on your background. He was at least the first pope. And, and for Paul to withstand him to the face, I withstood him to the face 
And the scripture goes on and says, because he was to be blamed. And what God is saying to the Galatians is, it's not the name of Peter or the name of John or the name of James. It isn't the super apostle. It's the word of God. I reckon it as a fact that I am not a whit behind the chief apostles. I looked at the facts, Legizomai, and I reached a logical conclusion based on fact that I was not one tiny bit behind the super apostles. That their name doesn't carry any more weight than mine. You know, surely there was a, there was a, a taint in many cases, a taint of legalism in Peter's preaching. You know, we don't have 13 or, or, or 14, depending on your view, epistles written by Peter and a, and a little one in there by Paul, like maybe Philemon, and then the rest of them by Peter and James and John. There was in those who followed close with the Lord Jesus the stain of legalism, a stain very difficult to wash out. It could be that in the fifth verse, I not only have Christian legalism, when I get down to the 13th and the 14th verse, I find at least some of these identified with Satan himself. The text is clearly telling me that there is teaching at Corinth contrary to the Spirit and the Gospel of Jesus Christ, teaching not centered on Christ, the doctrine of Christ. It's not the Spirit of Christ, and it's not the Gospel of Christ. I hear a tremendous amount of preaching today that's called the Gospel. Gospel means good news. It's a Greek word which means super good tidings. I have tremendous tidings for you. Well, those tidings are tremendous if, if you recognize the grace of God then that Jesus would die for you if you wanted him to. That's, that, folks, is not good news. Good news is he did. Now, that may fall on deaf ears because it's, it's a heart that's darkened, but if it is a heart that's lightened, it'll fall on a heart that God has lightened. I should not modify that news because it doesn't make sense to me. And somehow or other, I hear messages and literature replete with ideas of what God did, something like, like a stumbling scientist in the laboratories you know, somewhere, and he tries this, this thing, and he tries that thing, and he tries this thing, and that thing, and, and the other thing, and nothing seemed to work till he got to grace, and, and at least that works freely. You know, and if you'll accept, it'll work. And if you don't accept, it won't work. And we've made God into some kind of bumbling scientist. I believe God is God. Nothing caught him by surprise. That he's working all things out as he pleases according to his sovereign will, according to his sovereign plan. I looked at the evidence and I know that I'm in no, not in any way behind or inferior to the super apostles. And we're about to be introduced to the ministers of Satan. What I'm trying to say is that even in the case of those who belong to God, there is the possibility of a merit-based teaching which, which can be founded on Christ, but not in fact be the Spirit of Christ nor the Gospel of Christ. The context argues for false teachers who are identified as the ministers of Satan. I want you to realize that the text is going to say that Satan's messengers are in the pulpit preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our teaching might be legalistic rather than about the grace of God. However, ultimately we're going to come down to those identified as messengers of Satan. God's people today do teach legalism, which is contrary to the freedom of the grace of God that we have in Christ. I believe that to be one of the great errors of modern Christianity. 
Much of it, of course, is spoused by Satan's emissaries. Dearly beloved, I want you to recognize the text here. Our text is telling us that Satan has great power. Craftiness is the word. I don't know. I don't know how it's translated in your Bible. In, in your Bible, uh, subtlety. Uh, Satan through his subtlety, but the word is the Greek word for all, all ability. One could translate it, it literally translate it through Satan's ability to do anything. I want, I want you to recognize the Holy Spirit is not trying to shield you from the fact that our enemy is a powerful enemy. When it says he goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, you know, one, uh, one casual opinion might be that he's, well, he's looking for Christians that he can take to hell, and I, I don't believe that's Satan's purpose at all. But to defeat us in understanding the Word of God, that's what he wanted in Eve. Wanted to call God a liar. And I believe that's his energy today. I don't think Satan in any way expects to take one of God's children and put them in hell but rather to have one of God's children be a doubter and defeated in the grace of God. Verse 6, I was not behind the, the super apostles, although I be rude in speech. Rude, there your word rude is a Greek word that in, infers unskilled in words. Is That's the way I'd translate it. It is, it's the root word from which our word idiot comes. But uh, However, the Greek word did not carry the connotation that the word idiot carries today. It, it, it kind of carried rather the idea of, of one who is not skilled in a particular profession. You know, you, you uh, may be uh, a skilled craftsman when it comes to working with wood, and another man who, who couldn't work with wood at all would be called an idiot not because of the term, the way that we use it today, but because he did not possess your skills in that particular vocation. And so I believe the text is saying that though I be unskilled in the use of words, uh, the word there is logos. The text is not saying that I am unskilled in the Word of God, but that I am unskilled with words. The text does not say that he is, but the text is saying that they apparently conclude that. And even if that happened to be true, it is absolutely apparent that I am not unskilled in knowledge. Uh, that word, gnosko, the, the experiential knowledge, a knowledge that was fully manifested as an evidence of, of his association with God, that he was proclaiming the Word of God. The, uh, the sixth verse, I, I believe, is arguing that there was a full and complete revelation of that manifestation of, uh, of that in Corinth. They, they couldn't find anything in what he did which was contrary to what they know to be the Word of God. Uh, the Word as it existed then, the Word as it had been taught in the grace of Christ. The text goes on and says, contrary to those who would use you in such a way for their own gain, I, didn't, I did not at all, even though I had right to take money from you, that God ordained that, that they preach the gospel should live of the gospel. You know, I didn't do that. Because in this particular situation, it was spirit-directed that there be no foothold at all to accuse me of any any aims other than the grace of Jesus Christ. What I believe the text is saying is if you pull the money out of Corinth, I'd still have been there. The same work, the same preaching, which would not be true of those others. You know, whoever these are who are preaching this thing which is different from the Spirit in the Gospel of Christ. If you were to pull out from unto them any physical support, it wouldn't be there. And to me, 
That is a test of anyone's personal ministry of the Word of God. If the support evaporated, would the work be there? And that's going to be the argument of the next few verses. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.